I want to thank the American Association of University Women for partnering with the League in this presentation. I also want to thank RPV TV for videotaping and airing tonight's presentation on cable channel 33 and Verizon channel 38. So if you're a Verizon customer, it's 38. The tapes of this program will be shown next week, Monday through Sunday, at 1 p.m. Earlier, the League of Women Voters did a presentation on ballot measures. Those tapes will be shown next week, Monday through Sunday, at 8 p.m. Also, I want to thank the ITT Department of Rancho Palos Verdes for the sound coordination tonight. The League of Women Voters does not support or oppose political parties or candidates. We do take positions on public policy issues that we have studied. I'd like to remind the viewers um, about the League of Women Voters nonpartisan election information website, Smart Voter, www.smartvoter.org. And there are some little bookmarks outside um, about Smart Voter. You can find out a lot of information on that website. Remember that voting is that uh, November 6th is election day. You must be registered by October 22nd in order to vote. Um, you can find registration forms at the DMV or the post office, your library, and there are a few outside if you need them. If you plan to vote by mail, uh, you need to have your ballot into the Registrar Recorder's Office by, election, by the close of election day. So if you only have a couple of days and you've been left and you haven't mailed your ballot, then plan to turn it in at, one, at a polling place. You can just walk in and drop it off. You don't have to do anything else other than that, and it doesn't even have to be your polling place. Thank you for being here tonight, and now I'd like to turn the mic over to uh, the AUW president. Thank you, Nancy, and I'm very glad to see everyone here this evening. I'm Sherry May, chair of the Palos Verdes Peninsula branch of the AAUW. The American Association of University Women is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization founded in 1881, supporting women and their families through education, advocacy, philanthropy, and research. Today, we have over 150,000 members, over 1,000 branches, and over 700 colleges and universities that we work with. AUW has a very strong public policy agenda. Since our founding, we have examined and taken positions on fundamental issues that affect women and girls. This year, our branch is involved in a national initiative the National Voter Education and Registration Initiative. And as part of that, we're really pleased to be joining with the Palos Verdes League of Women Voters to bring these events to you. But tonight, we're going to focus on the very important 33rd Congressional District and have a chance to talk with the candidates. It's my pleasure now to introduce Joanne Waller, who is the Director of Voter Education of the Palos Verdes League, and she's going to begin tonight's conversation with the candidates. Joanne. Thank you, Sherry, and good evening to all of you. The format this evening will be as follows. Following their introductions, each candidate will make a three-minute opening statement. The order of speaking was determined by drawing lots. Then each candidate will be allowed another three minutes to respond to a League of Women Voters AAUW question. Following that, each candidate will have two minutes to respond to each written question from the audience. League and AAUW members have been moving among the audience, passing out cards and pencils. So if you haven't already asked your question, please do so. 
I will read the questions from the podium. The forum will close with a one minute summary by each candidate. And this will take place in the opposite order of the opening statement. Now with your questions, I have been reading some of your questions. We need the question. We do not need a treatise on a particular topic. So please, ladies and gentlemen, just ask your question. Our timekeepers for this evening are Arlene Block and Terry Arnish. They will notify the speakers when they have one minute, hold up the one minute, 30 seconds, hold that up, and then when it is time to stop. So we have put them in front because we didn't want the candidates to miss them. We ask that you hold your applause until the end of the forum, and please turn off your cell phone. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce your top two congressional candidates for the 33rd Congressional District. To my far right, Mr. Bill Bloomfield, and next to me, Mr. Henry A. Waxman. We will now begin our opening statements. Bill will begin first, and he has three minutes. Bill? Thank you, Joanne. I want to thank the League of Women Voters and AAUW and Congressman Waxman for being here tonight. I am worried about the future of our country for the simple reason that Congress has quit working. It's locked up in hyper-partisanship, made up of men and women who are spending their time bickering, trying to score political points, working on their re-election, and doing everything but solving our nation's serious problems, like our job crisis and our trillion dollar budget deficits. I think I'm qualified to go back to DC and fix Congress, not only because of my business background and active involvement within our community, but also because I've worked for political reforms that are so necessary to have a government that is beholden to the people and not special interests. I have worked for election reforms, not against them like the congressman, in order to have fair district lines drawn by a nonpartisan citizens commission, not by politicians trying to protect their seats. And I've worked to give independents a voice with open primaries. The fact is, if my opponent had had his way, this election would have been decided over a year ago by his political friends in Sacramento who would have drawn him another safe seat for 10 more years. Now, along with working for reforms, I have taken on special interests that unduly influence both political parties. I've gone after the special interests that finance the Republican Party, such as the tobacco and gun lobbies. But unlike my opponent, I have also taken on the special interests that finance the Democratic Party. Now here's why that matters. We all want good functioning K-12 education. But I'm the only one of the two candidates that will take on the political arm of the teachers union in order to make it happen. And I've taken the first step necessary to help get Congress working by being one of the co-founders of No Labels, a group working to reduce the hyper-partisanship in Congress. In fact, our No Budget, No Pay proposal has 90 co-sponsors. While we should all thank the Congressman for his 44 years of service, his hyper-partisan approach is not working to solve our country's massive problems. Over the years, he's become one of the most partisan of them all with his voting with his party bosses over 99% of the time the last four years. He even told a reporter two years ago that the loss of a few moderate Democrats could be a good thing because it might help purify 
the Democratic Caucus. Those are the words and actions of someone who's part of the problem, not part of the solution. Our country needs the nonpartisan approach that I bring now more than ever. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot have all this clapping. It is going to take up too much time. So please refrain until the end, and then we'll give them a big applause. OK, Henry, it's thank your three minutes. Thank you very much. I want to thank the League of Women Voters and the AAUW to sponsor this event today. I want to tell you that my role in public office has been the same from the very beginning to today. I fight for what I believe in. And I never pretend to be something that I'm not. I fight proposals that I think are bad for this country, and I'll do it if it's from a Republican or a Democrat. But I look for opportunities to bridge partisan differences, to get something done. I had Republicans fight me when I proposed to clean up our air, to make our drinking water food and our food safe. They fought it. I stood up to them. But we finally reached a compromise that resulted in very important legislation. When we first looked at the AIDS epidemic, some of the extremists in the Republican Party thought that what we ought to do is take people with AIDS, quarantine them on some island somewhere, get rid of them. Well, we finally got to the point where we passed the Ryan White Act so that we could approach this in a reasonable and effective way. When I took on the tobacco, uh, tobacco uh, interests, I had the CEOs of the tobacco companies come before my committee. We did a full investigation of what that industry was up to. And we finally passed legislation I was proud to stand with President Obama when he signed it. We tried to reform the healthcare system. We tried to put essential nutritional labeling information available to consumers. We brought competition to the pharmaceutical industry with generic drugs, which have lowered the price for people who buy those drugs. And we put in important safety standards for our loved ones in nursing homes. Uh, we have differences, Mr. Bloomfield and I. He has, uh, he has been a strong supporter of the Republican Party. He has had a lifetime commitment to supporting Republican candidates and causes. He has frequently funded the very people that I've had to fight back on some of their more extreme positions. But I respect the fact that we have differences on public policy and on politics, but the essence of our democracy is to air those differences and let the voters decide. So I'm looking forward to the discussion tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Now we will go to the question from the League of Women Voters and the American Association of University Women. Are there areas of the federal budget you would reduce or eliminate and revenue sources you would increase to reduce the federal deficit? We gave this question to the candidates in advance so they could do research and give us some specific answers. So this time we are going to start with Henry. Okay, well thank you very much. I think we can get $2 trillion easily. First of all, cut out corporate welfare. Stop the oil companies from getting the deduction that they get. They get $4 billion a year, $40 billion over 10 years. If we uh, let the Bush tax cuts for the wealthy expire, that would bring in $800 billion. If we uh, made sure that Medicare paid for drugs under the discount that we paid for those drugs when uh, the Medicaid program paid for it, we could save uh, $80 billion over 10 years. And if we put a price on carbon pollution, which could solve our problem of global warming and give incentives for industries, to hold down pollution, that can bring in a trillion dollars itself over 10 years. So there are things we certainly can do. But I want to point out that we've done it in the past. I was in the Congress 
1992 when President Clinton proposed a balanced approach, $1 in revenues for $1 in cuts. And let's recognize why we have this big deficit. When President Clinton left office, he passed over to his successor, President George W. Bush, a surplus. And what the Bush administration did was provided two generous tax cuts, primarily for the upper income people, without paying for it. Then we ended up in two wars without paying for that. When the prescription drug for Medicare was adopted, that wasn't paid for. And then when the economy went over the cliff, thank God not all the way to a depression, but into a severe recession, that caused an even greater deficit. Uh, I'll tell you what I want us to do, a balanced approach, but I'll tell you what I don't want to do and will not do. I will not support a proposal that will make Medicare a voucher or privatize Social Security or uh, slash the Medicaid program, which is the program in California we call Medi-Cal that serves the disabled, disabled children who might need 24-hour care and their parents can't provide it and they can't pay for it or nursing home care for seniors. I won't slash that program as the Republicans are proposed to do in their budget. I can't see how we could say to people who are most vulnerable, we can't provide services for you any longer because we gotta give tax breaks to the super wealthy. Thank you, Bill? I like the recommendations from President Obama's Deficit Reduction Commission to rein in our budget deficit. It's the single biggest failing of all the leaders in Congress not to have supported this bipartisan recommendation when it came out in January of 2011. The good news, however, is that President Obama and Governor Romney have both recently spoken favorably on it. What it, some of the recommendations, again, which I support, include freezing discretionary spending at the 2012 level by freezing uh, federal pay and reducing the numbers by 10%. Now, in terms of pay, that include, includes congressional pay. Believe it or not, they've given themselves a pay increase every year through the recession. It includes reducing agricultural support payments that uh, such a program uh, causes or, uh, all consumers in the United States to pay 80% more for sugar than the rest of the world. It includes permanently getting rid of earmarks. Uh, Congressman Waxman has voted 60 times to continue allowing earmarks, which are really nothing more than legalized bribes. Uh, want to end corporate welfare, such as things like Solyndra-type projects. I want to add a year to the retirement age in Social Security in 2050, as well as 2075, which again is recommended by the President Obama's uh, Simpson-Bowles Deficit Reduction Commission to help shore up Social Security. And finally, on the uh, spending side, we need to allow the federal government to negotiate bulk purchases of drugs, which for some reason Congressman Waxman's Affordable Care Act prohibits. By allowing the federal government to negotiate the prices of bulk drugs, it will save our country 15 to 20 billion dollars a year. On the revenue side, we should end the tax deduction of all gold-plated health care plans, including those of unions and corporations that support Congressman Waxman's party. We should raise the payroll taxes for Social Security above 108,000 a year. We need to bring state and municipal government workers into the Social Security system, and we need to end the, the carried interest rule that allows hedge fund managers to pay a capital gains rate when their employees are paying less than half the rate that they're paying. As far as taxes overall, I like the recommendation of the Deficit Reduction Commission that recommends getting rid of all loopholes and uh, lowering the rates down to uh, lowering the marginal rates and also getting rid of uh, a lot of the deductions. Both moves will bring in uh, more dollars to the federal government and create more jobs by lowering the marginal rate. The Commission's balanced proposal uh, moves us toward a balanced budget with $4 in spending cuts for every dollar of tax increase and 50% of the revenue from the tax increases is paid for by the top 1%. Thank you. Now we come to the audience questions. Each candidate will have two minutes to answer each of these questions. 
and if I can read your handwritings, <laughs> then we will get the question out. First question, what is your opinion toward federal recognition of same-sex couples? So this time we'll start with Bill. I voted no on Proposition 8. <clears throat> I believe that uh, in the state of California that uh, we should allow same-sex marriage. As far as the federal issue on it, I would vote to repeal the Defense of Marriage Act. I think the federal government should recognize same-sex marriage that uh, in the states where the states want to recognize it. Henry? I support same-sex marriage. I voted against the so-called Defense of Marriage Act, which was passed by uh, the Republicans primarily in the Congress. But I w want to use my time to go back to some of the things that uh, uh, Mr. Bloomfield said. And he went through a list so quickly that it was sort of hard to keep track of it all. One, I uh, was the leader in ending earmarks in Congress. I was one of the first to volunteer not to offer any earmark legislation because it's out of hand. And then later, others joined us, and I'm pleased to say the rules of the House prohibit it. I don't want us to, uh, oh, the other thing is negotiating drugs. The, it's outrageous that the government doesn't negotiate drugs that we buy for people under Medicare. You've got a large population. You ought to demand a discount for those drugs. The law that says we can't negotiate isn't the Affordable Care Act. It's the Republican passed version of the Medicare prescription drug bill. I voted against that bill for, among other reasons, that it didn't give people the best break for drugs. It was great for the drug companies, and it was great for the insurance companies, but it really didn't do all it could uh, for seniors. And I guess this is a very small point, but my wife is here, and she will tell you, we have not gotten the cost of living increase for many, many years. So uh, you, sh you should get some of those facts straight. And I wouldn't want to ask people to wait too long for Medicare because a lot of those people need health insurance. They need their coverage. If we ask people to wait for that, a lot of them are going to uh, hopefully get health insurance under the Affordable Care Act, but the health insurance that they'll buy will cost them more. And it will cost more for everybody because Medicare is a lot less expensive way as a public program to pay for health care services than making people wait and have to pay more for their insurance and more out of pocket for the services that they'll need. Thank you. Our next question. What is your opinion of the Supreme Court Citizens United decision? And uh, we're starting with Henry on this one. And would you explain for the audience what that decision was? Why don't you explain it? Because I, I don't want to use my time. <laughs> <laughs> well, give your opinion then. Well, I, I, want to, I want to repeal that Citizens United opinion. It allows corporations to give unlimited dollars to campaigns without even having to disclose the contributors. It is such an outrage. Our whole campaign finance system is an outrage to start with. That's why I was one of the original co-sponsors of the McCain-Feingold Act. And it's why I've supported legislation to provide voluntary public financing of campaigns with limits on expenditures. I don't think the people with the most money ought to get the win in an election. And I don't want that to come from corporations or unions or the candidate's personal wealth. I think what we need is to give everybody a chance to compete for public office and not to keep people from even thinking about going into public service because they don't have the personal wealth to do it or they don't have access uh, to uh, the, uh, the usual political funding. So I want us to reform the campaign finance system, repeal the Citizens United, which will take two things, either a constitutional amendment or another Obama couple appointees to the Supreme Court to overturn that five to four position. And uh, at the minimum, Congress ought to pass a disclosure requirement. And that has been blocked by the Republicans in the Congress. And I think it's overdue that we pass it into law so people know who's putting up the money. Thank you. Bill? The Citizen United decision was a terrible decision. 
Uh, I agree with the Congressman that it does definitely need to be overturned. Um, it's interesting, uh, what the Congressman talks about uh, reforms, the need for campaign finance reform. Several times in the Congressman's 38 years, his political party and he have owned everything, including the first year of the Obama administration. That would have been a really good time to enact campaign finance reform. Uh, the fact is, the Congressman has raised uh, over $13 million since 1979, and he hasn't had an election because of the gerrymandering. I uh, started the year with a million and a half dollars in campaign cash. The reason the million and a half was there was to discourage anyone else to run from running against him. The fact is, it takes money to run against a sitting congressman, particularly one that has a lot of money in the bank. And it's too bad that, as I said, that uh, we're at the point we are because we absolutely need to pass a campaign finance uh, uh, reform. Uh, I agree about the Disclosure Act. Uh, I absolutely would support the Democratic proposal. What I don't understand is the SEC, right now, on their own, could mandate that publicly held corporations disclose to their shareholders all of their political contributions. That has not taken place. It should take place. I want to correct a couple of things because I'm, you know, we, hopefully we have some press here and they can research it. Uh, 60 times there were proposals to formally end all earmarks and the congressman voted no on it. Now, there's no point in going back and forth. The facts are the facts. Uh, as far as drugs, uh, Congressman, you have defended the Affordable Care Act, which prohibits the federal government from negotiating bulk prescription drug prices. I don't know, frankly, I don't get it. Uh, you have defended it recently, and as you know, 60 Democratic House members wrote a letter to Speaker Boehner asking him in all... You said stop. I'll finish my thoughts. <laughs> Thank you, Bill. You know what? <laughs> okay, next question. How would you better support veterans at the VA facility, and what does your plan encompass? So, Bill, we start with you this time. The Veterans Administration facility in Brentwood is a disgrace. Uh, I recently toured the facility, and it's like going back in time. You see buildings that were built for war, to house World War I veterans, and it looks like there's nothing else there except occasionally you'll see something new, like a, a ball field, a soccer field, or a, uh, a gymnasium, and then you realize none of those facilities are for the veterans. And it's a 400-acre facility that was deeded to the federal government that is designed specifically to house our veterans. In this area, we have at least 10,000 homeless veterans, and 2,500 of them are severely disabled. And I, I think it is beyond the pale that our country does not house them. Now, Congressman Waxman, to his credit, five years ago, wrote the Veterans Administration to find out what's happening with all the money that's come from the private leases. It's, it's estimated to be tens of millions of dollars. And why hasn't the money been spent on building housing for our veterans? Well, the problem is, it's been five years and the congressman still has not gotten a response. It is beyond the pale, it is deplorable. Now, if he is so powerful, and remind the congressman that uh, you've been there 10 years and you killed the Beverly Hills subway, so it's hard for me to understand why you can't get an answer to the letter of where is the money and why we can't build the housing, I would immediately uh, do what I can to set up a plan to build housing at least for the 2,500 severely disabled veterans that are in this area. Henry? I um, feel very strongly about our obligation to our veterans. They put their lives on the line. Some of them come back crippled physically and mentally. We have an obligation, a moral obligation, to take care of them. I have fought for an, over a decade to stop Republicans from selling that VA land. The Republicans think it would be a great idea if they made it into a shopping mall. They think they can get a lot of money. Secretary Nicholson, who was the secretary under George W. Bush, wanted to sell the land. And so that prompted uh, Diane Feinstein and myself to put in legislation 
to stop any sale of or commercialization of the land that was given for the sole purpose of, of helping our veterans. Uh, the fight doesn't end, even though we have a law, because that law can be changed. And Eric Cantor, the majority leader for the Republicans, proposed selling that land for deficit reduction, not even to help the veterans. I've been working very hard to get homes for the veterans. I am so frustrated at the bureaucracy under both Democrats and Republicans at the VA in Washington and the VA in West LA, because even though Feinstein and I got $20 million designated for a rehab of one of the buildings, eventually all three, for home, homes for homeless veterans, it, they have not gotten it done. I wrote to Secretary Shinseki, I want that contract by the end of this month. I want that construction to start. We waited long enough. Enough is enough. We have too much of a debt that we've got to start paying for our veterans. Thank you. Next question. How do you think the banking industry should be regulated? Should Glass-Steagall be brought back? Henry, I, first this time. Yeah, I voted against repealing Glass-Steagall. The Glass-Steagall Act was adopted during the Great Depression to say that the banks couldn't take their depositors' money and then take all sorts of risks with it. Well, that was repealed by a bipartisan vote and a law that was signed by President Clinton. I voted against it. And uh, I think we've got to make sure that we don't have these super banks and uh, money managers playing games with our money. That's what caused this recession. My committee, when I was chairman of the oversight committee, held hearings on it. And we saw these CEOs get bonuses of millions of dollars while their companies were going down the tubes. They got big bonuses and salaries when they did well. They got bonuses and big salaries when the companies went broke. Their shareholders were left with nothing. Their employees were fired. The regulators weren't on the job. Luckily, we have the Dodd-Frank Act that will require regulation, regulation to make sure that the Wild West is not the way we're going to let private industry handle the future economy of this nation. Thank you. Bill? I agree with the congressman that it was too bad that Glass-Siegel was repealed. It should not have been. If we could get that genie back in the bottle, if we can, we should. I fear we can't. But I disagree that the cure that congressman, Congress came up with, Dodd-Frank, is not worse than the disease. What needed to happen was two things. Number one, that banks that were too big to fail need to be reduced in size. They need to be broken up. And there haven't been any banks broken up since Dodd-Frank, since the crisis. In fact, the larger banks have all grown larger. The other thing that needs to happen is the regulators need to be told simply that taxpayer guaranteed money needs to be protected. If we're going to allow the banks to engage in investment bank, banking uh, 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 business, if we can't put Glass-Siegel back in the bottle, we need to make sure that the banks have enough collateral to protect all of taxpayer funds. But as far as uh, the financial crisis, we should keep in mind that, yes, Congress has a major hand in this, and repealing Glass-Siegel was one of the problems. The other problem was Congress encouraging Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to make these low, no interest or low interest teaser rate loans with no money down. Now, we all heard them here in California. I don't know if they made it to the, to the East Coast, but we all heard the ads, and all of us who heard it knew this wasn't going to end well. So for the future, we need Congress to stay out of things like that. But Dodd-Frank, with its 2,500 pages, is strangling our system. And it's nice that we have no money down loans available. The only problem is no one can get them because the banks won't lend because of the strangulation of this regulation of this massive uh, Dodd-Frank bill. Thank you. Now on to our next question. 
what is your plan to solve the illegal immigration problem? And Bill, you're first this time. We were lied to in the 80s when uh, Tip O'Neill and President Reagan negotiated amnesty. It was called amnesty back then. <clears throat> and we gave 8 million uh, illegals a path to citizenship. We were told that when that happened, they were, we were going to secure the borders and that we would have a guest worker program. Now, business or labor, who is at fault? Who knows? We got neither. And so we ended up now with 10 million more illegal immigrants. We need to continue securing the border. I don't know what's taking so long. The good news is that we are absolutely making progress. The flows are down. What we need to do is continue securing the border. And when we get to the point where we have reduced the flows to 90 from by 90% from what they were at its peak in like 07, we need to then have a path for citizenship for all of the people in this country who have only broken one law, and that is being in this country illegally. We need these people to be in the economy and get them out of the underground economy. We need them to prosper. We need uh, them to be educated. Um, I, that, that is my, uh, that is my um, uh, plan for illegal immigration. Thank you. Henry? We need to stop the uh, illegal immigration across our borders. I think that's happening. It's much more successful. The other part of the law that has not been successful is making sure employers don't hire undocumented aliens because that's why they're coming here. It's the magnet of jobs. And when employers hire people, notwithstanding the fact that the law prohibits it, uh, it it's going to continue to have the effect of drawing people here. But we've got to do something about all the people that are here, and we're not going to be able to deport them. So we ought to keep them out of the shadow of life, which George W. Bush pointed out, where they can be taken advantage of, and have a way for them to have a path to be here legally. Now, Mr. Bloomfield said they only broke one law coming here illegally. There are a lot of kids that came here with their parents. They've lived here in the, all their lives. The DREAM Act would allow them to get an education and become a citizen. That was a bipartisan bill until it passed the House and it went to the Senate, where the Republicans filibustered it. Uh, Mr. Bloomfield talked about things the Democrats didn't do when the Democrats were in power, like pass some campaign finance laws or whatever. You can't pass laws when you've got a Republican filibuster that keeps a majority in the Senate from operating. I've heard a number of criticisms from Mr. Bloomfield about the Democrats. I know he says he's an independent. Uh, I'm criticizing Republicans because I'm a proud Democrat. I don't know what a proud independent does, but he sounds to me like someone who's much more critical of the Democrats than anybody else. Thank you. Next question. What should be our short-term and long-term goals in the Middle East? And Mr. Waxman, Henry, you're first. Uh, in the Middle East, uh, it's a very uh, moving situation. The uh, People in the Arab uh, world want democracy. They want a different life. They want a better life than they've had. They've been ruled over by autocrats, some of whom we've supported. They've demanded uh, more liberalism in society. But on the other hand, as they move to democracy, uh, many of the people there end up stuck with uh, militant uh, Islamic governments. Egypt had the demonstrations for democracy, and now they have a president from the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, that is the organization who had a member that killed President Sadat, the man who took great risks to bring peace to the Middle East. In the course of all of this, we've got to stand by Israel. It's our only real ally. They share our values. It's a democracy. It looks after our concerns. And the threat to Israel and all of us is for if Iran got a nuclear weapon. I applaud President Obama, but
for the strategy he has followed to use sanctions that are ever tightening on Iran and using diplomacy to get them to give up the efforts to develop a nuclear bomb. We've been working very closely with Israel and in intelligence. We've been working with them on some uh, cyber attacks and other ways to, to sidetrack uh, the Iranians from producing a bomb. We've got to succeed. But I get nervous when I hear Mitt Romney and Paul Ryan and a lot of Republicans who want to go back to the neoconservative point of view, let's go to war first. They took us into war in Iraq on false pretenses. Never go to war first. Try diplomacy, try sanctions, play it out. And the president has brought together an international coalition, not just sanctions by us, but others as well, to make Iran back off. Thank you. Bill? Well, the existential threat of our time is Iran. We absolutely cannot let them ever achieve nuclear capability. I, like the congressman, uh, like in general what President Obama is doing in terms of tightening the noose around Iran. The thing that I cons am concerned about and wondering about is when did our intelligence service get so good? We were told a few years ago that North Korea was years away from developing nuclear weapons, and that was about three months before they ignited one. We're still looking, we never found the weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. I am, I would, I am thinking that the, are uh, wishing that we would be faster on putting the noose around Iran. The world as we know it will change when Iran, if Iran becomes nuclear capable, we absolutely cannot let that happen. As far as uh, the other short-term thing in the, near, in the Middle East is I believe we should take a lesson from what we did in Libya and obtain air superiority in Syria. There's thousands of innocent freedom fighters in Syria that are losing their lives and we could save them if we would obtain attain air superiority. We did it in Libya without a loss of a single life. As far as long term, we need, uh, we need peace in the Middle East. And one of the ways to get it, along with obviously supporting Israel and making it clear that Israel is our friend and our closest ally in the region, and not criticizing them in public, but doing it only in private, we need to get off of foreign oil. If we weren't buying eight and a half million barrels of foreign oil a day, the regime in Iran would collapse, let alone not have money to fund terrorism. Uh, it wouldn't be so good for uh, Prime, Premier, Prime Minister Putin, and it wouldn't be so good for Venezuela either. Uh, by the way, I support the DREAM Act. Congressman Waxman, he had a filibuster-approved Congress the first year of the Obama administration. And as far as taking on the Republican Party, go to my website. Thank you. Next question. In terms of American foreign policy, do you favor the soft power or the hard power approach? And I guess, Bill, you get stuck with that question first. Uh, the, the soft power. I like uh, what Teddy Roosevelt said, speak softly and carry a big stick. Uh, this is the problem when you're talking about uh, uh, foreign policy is, you know, I like playing poker and I'm pretty good at it and I'm a really good bluffer. But I tell you something, I win more pots when I have a good hand. And there's a whole lot of things we want done from other countries. And let's start with China. We need China to participate in, in uh, global warming initiatives and reduce their emissions of greenhouse gases. We need them to trade fairly. We need them to not war with Japan in, uh, uh, in the South China Sea. We need China to help us rid the, the Korean Peninsula of nuclear weapons. But here's the deal. China doesn't want to do it, so how are we going to get them to do it when we need them to buy our bonds? It's, you know, we have no negotiating stance. We need to, in terms of foreign policy, secure this economic security and the defense security of the United States. The, summing, the coming sequestration, which is threatening to put us back in a, in a, uh, in a recession, and unilaterally cut our defense budget by $200 billion. If you're China, you're going to sit back, eat popcorn, and watch the show. You're not going to engage with us. Thank you. Henry? 
The question is whether we should use soft power or hard power. We should use both. We should use it wisely. We should look to diplomacy first, but always have the ability to do whatever we need to do in our national interests and work with other countries, not act unilaterally. But I want to say uh, about Mr. Bloomfield's website taking on the Republican Party, he seems to disagree with the Republican Party a lot. But it's hard for me to understand how he can disagree with the Republican Party when he spent his life as a Republican. He's given the Republican candidates and their causes over $2 million. He switched to being an independent, but after he switched to become supposedly an independent, he gave Mitt Romney the maximum amount of money he could contribute to him. He gave the maximum he could give to the Republican Senate Campaign Committee. He gave the maximum he could to John Boehner to keep the Republicans in power in the House. And what are the Republicans doing in the House and in the Congress? They're trying to repeal a woman's right to choose a position you don't agree with. They're trying to uh, tear down our environmental protections. They want to make Medicare a voucher plan. They want to take away Medicaid and take the guarantee for vulnerable people. This has been, if you call me partisan, the Tea Party Republican radicals have controlled the House of Representatives, and that's why we've never gotten a compromise, because they don't believe in compromise. If you don't agree with the party, why do you fund them? You obviously must agree with them because you're giving them you have given you given you have given them your money, and I think that you ought to be held responsible for what that party is doing because you funded them. Thank Do you. It. Our next question: What is your position? on Proposition 32 on the California ballot, and please explain why you feel as you do. And Mr. Uh, Henry, you are first. Thank you very much. Proposition 32 has been on the ballot before. It's been defeated by the people in California. I hope it will be defeated again. It has only one purpose, and that's to stop labor unions from being able to contribute to candidates and campaigns. Uh, it does not affect corporations at all. It only affects labor unions. If you think it's a reform, the League of Women Voters has opposed Proposition 32. Every campaign watchdog organization opposes Proposition 32. It is not a reform, it's a political grab by the Republicans. And it's interesting that my opponent and his family has given over a million dollars to support Proposition 32. This is not a reform. It is an attempt by the Republicans to be the only ones who will have campaign funding from the big corporations and the special interests. And if Democrats want, if Democrats want to get some help from the unions, as well as some of those corporations, until we get public financing, they want to make sure that that's no longer available to us. It ought to be defeated. I'm strongly against it, and I hope everybody in the audience here and watching on cable will vote against Proposition 32, follow the recommendations of the League of Women Voters and Common Cause and other groups that speak for the public interest. Uh, Bill? I'm strongly in favor of Proposition 32, and I'm proud of my mother for putting a million dollars in supporting that initiative. There is absolutely nothing in Proposition 32, and I encourage anybody to, everybody to read it, that anyone would disagree with. The valid criticism, and there's only one, is that it doesn't do enough. There are things in it that there shouldn't be. I tried to get the group that was working on writing the initiative to include a requirement that corporations get shareholder approval before they make contributions. It didn't succeed. I am in favor of a follow-on initiative once Proposition 32 passes to do that. Uh, the reason that the government unions and Congressman Waxman are having a fit is because the playing field is so unlevel, le leaning toward the government unions. And they are the ones that are sponsoring all of the all of the uh, political ads fighting it. 
The LA Times ran an expose about six weeks ago about the power of the government unions in the legislature. If you didn't read it, I suggest you do. They consider themselves the fourth house of government. Now, the fact is, as far as it doesn't do anything with corporations, corporations gave $28 million to candidates for state office in this state. It is illegal in most states, but it is legal in California. That is real reform. Yes, because of Citizen United, you cannot prohibit corporations from giving money to independent expenditures, unfortunately. But Citizen United decision, hopefully someday, will be overturned. Uh, a couple of other points. The $2 million he's citing that I gave in supposedly to conservative causes, the main causes, was redistricting reform and open primaries. It was opposed by the Republican Party. I went to some events in March. One of them was to, with my mother to see Senator McCain, who's a friend of mine, and his Okay, thank you. On to the next question. How would you strengthen environmental protection? And this person is interested in a more aggressive approach on renewables. So Bill, your turn to go first. I really care about the environment. I, uh, as you know, I lived my whole life here. I remember going to Paul Revere Junior High School and needing notes from my mom in order to excuse me from running around the track because I have asthma. I drink the water here, I breathe the air, and I swim in the Santa Monica Bay. We need to uh, focus on our environment. I am 100% opposed to repealing any environmental legislation or laws in this country. The issue of the day is global warming. It threatens our, the world as, uh, in, unless we get a handle on greenhouse gas emissions. But here's the deal. The United States is the only industrialized democracy in the last 10 years that has actually reduced its greenhouse gas emissions. During the 10 years, China has more than doubled its greenhouse gas emissions. Other countries have doubled and tripled their greenhouse gas emissions. I support cap and trade, the concept, and I support a carbon tax, but that won't get the job done. In fact, will do more harm than good if we don't get the other polluters in the world to go along with it, such as, and particularly, in China. It won't do us any good if we send a manufacturer from, the, from California <clears throat> that is burning natural gas and because of increasing the cost of energy, force that manufacturer to set up shop in China and burn coal. We can kid ourselves in thinking we're improving the environment, we're not. It takes a global initiative. We need to get our economic house in order. We need to get our financial house in order so we can negotiate and work with the other countries, particularly China, to quit and, and get on board and cut their greenhouse gas emissions with us. Thank you, Henry. We need to protect our environment and make it as safe for us to be able to breathe the air and protect our, our ability to uh, sustain life on this planet because climate change is occurring. The Republicans in the Congress deny the science, if you can believe it. They say there's no problem of greenhouse gases. There's no problem of climate change. It's just a hoax. And the Republican majority voted to say it's a hoax because I made them have to vote on that proposition when I offered an amendment to a bill. If we're cleaner in the air in Los Angeles, I'm pleased because I was one of the principal, if not the principal author of the Clean Air Act and revisions. I care a lot about reducing air pollution, but you know what the Republicans in the House did this last year? They voted to take out the heart of the Clean Air Act. The heart of it is that we have to achieve standards to protect public health. They took that out and said the standard should be what's necessary to protect the profits of the polluting industries. Climate change is an issue that we have to take leadership in, on doing something. 
and not just wait for somebody else to do it. China didn't do it, this one didn't do it, so we won't do it. We ought to pass a strong law to reduce carbon emissions using renewable fuels as an alternative to the fossil fuels. Use e greater efficiency in the use of our energy so we can reduce our dependence on that energy, especially oil and coal. We can't just say China and this, and we've got to get our house in order. Show some leadership. We did it when we found out that the upper ozone was deteriorating. It was a problem for the whole world. We passed a law first, and then our negotiator, negotiator agreed to an international uh, protocol for all the countries to follow us. Don't just say it. Not, my time is up. <laughs> Okay, we are going to take a break now for about five or six minutes. So you may get up and walk around, but please be back into your seats in that amount of time. <laughs>